afternoon, everyone, from the Centre for Print Research here at W Block in Frenchay. And it is a proper lunchtime seminar because I have two of my colleagues sitting right next to me here eating their lunches. I shall can turn the camera over there in a moment. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. A happy, very happy new year to everyone. And welcome to our first lunchtime seminar of 2022. Um, we've got Laura, Dr. Laura Morgan with us, who is a Walscott Fellow in Design Material Futures here at the Centre for Print, Print, for Print Research. I must get F. Um, and um, she's going to tell us a bit about her cross um, collaborative research and uh, in textiles and laser uh, engineering as well. So without further ado, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, there will be an opportunity for some questions afterwards. And uh, as usual, uh, our seminars are recorded and you can look back at some recordings from the CFPR website. So Laura, thank you for joining us today and over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. And I shall share your slides. Here you go. down because I can sound down. Echo of my account. Can you still hear me if I have the sound down? I've turned the volume down here as well, so we should be okay now. Okay. So Hi, everyone. Um, you can pop on to the next slide, please, Frank. Oh. <laughs> That's the one. Great, thanks. Um, so hi everyone. Um, as Frank said, I'm a senior research fellow in design and material futures here at CFPR. Um, and my research in a nutshell looks at ways to improve sustainability in the design and manufacturing of materials. So last year I was awarded a UE's Vice Chancellor's ECR award for 2020 and 21. And that funded the work that I'm gonna talk about today um, so with that award, I was able to hire Rosie Haywood as a research associate to help me on the project. Um, next slide, please. That's the one. Um, and I've come to describe the work as kind materials research. Um, so as textile design researchers, we were both fueled by a desire to disrupt the systemic problems with the way we design and use textiles. Um, and the kind materials ethos proposes that digital technology can be used in harmony with natural materials, taking a holistic view of design responsibility by considering human and animal rights as, as well as environmental stewardship. So in this work, the goal was to research sustainable alternatives to chemical dyeing and finishing. And we did that by integrating bio-based dyeing processes with laser technology. Um, today I'm going to showcase some of the results showing how digital technology can be used in harmony with natural materials um, and also natural coloration methods to move towards these uh, kinder material systems for textile design and production. Next slide please. So um, you're all very aware of the stark warnings of accelerated climate change. Um, well, the fashion and textile sector is up there among the most polluting global industries and the need for a new relationship with our clothes and new systems for their production has become really, really critical. Um, the environmental and social impacts of dyeing, printing and finishing are actually some of the most damaging processes within the textile industry and um, water and air pollution can be really devastating to both dye house workers and of course to our aquatic ecosystems as well um, and that's only made worse by global mass production. Um, of course commercially there are some perceived advantages of synthetic dyes including their fastness, their longevity and their vibrancy but those same traits that give them these highly stable properties 
also mean that they're incredibly difficult to break down. And so most conventional chemical dyes and finishes um, e render even natural materials as, as non-biodegradable. So what can we do? Um, well, natural dyes seem like an obvious choice to reduce chemical effluent in textile processing. But there are issues around durability that mean that natural standards. Um, additionally, unfortunately, to, to make natural dyes colour fast, heavy metal salts are routinely used as the most effective mordants for natural dyes, which is fine on a small scale or kind of designer maker level. But if these were to be upscaled, uh, some of those common metal salts can be just as harmful as synthetic chemical dyes and auxiliaries which um, would completely negate the sustainable profile. Uh, next slide, please. So to address some of these issues around dyeing, we began by investigating alternative pretreatments to enhance natural dyeing, moving away from metal salts and towards some experimental biomordants. The materials that we conducted all our investigations on was a 100% linen um, and that was really important to the ethos of the project. Um, linen comes from the flax plant, it's a really hardy plant that doesn't require chemical fertilizers or pesticides um, and also it can be grown in temperate climates such as the UK. So um, now you can see from this list we began with like a really large set of alternative pretreatments that included um, protein binders, uh, soy milk and aquafaba, polysaccharides, which we used um, algae-based alginate and agar-agar and uh, fungal origin chitosan derived from mushrooms. Uh, we used simplocos as a bioaccumulator. Um, we used oak gall nut and tannic acid and uh, sumac leaves as tannins. Um, and we used as a kind of control and comparison, um, more traditional alum based metal salts. Alum tend to be the more, uh, the more environmentally friendly uh, of the metal salts that are available. Alum's actually quite common in, in a lot of products that we would use, including some foodstuffs and uh, cosmetics and things like that. Um, and so we tried alum lactate, alum acetate, and regular alum, which is actually alum potassium sulfate. Um, and also looked at laser irradiation as a pretreatment, which I'll come to later. So um, a number of those yielded comparable color strength values to alum. So we took forward the most successful, and that was one from each group. We took forward the chitosan, the simplocos, the soya, and the gall nut. Next slide, please. So just to give you a little bit of information about each of these. Uh, firstly, gall nuts are small kind of balls that are formed around the base of oak trees. They're naturally very high in tannins. And to yield a uh, highest color strength, we treated our fabrics in like a two-step process of the gall nut tannin treatment, followed by the chosen biomordant. A two-step process with tannin is really commonplace for natural dyeing. Uh, for cellulose-based materials. Um, and then with the chitosan, chitosan is a polysaccharide. It's said to be actually one of the most abundant sub substances in the natural world. Um, it can be found in the shells of crustaceans and also within fungi. Um, I sourced a fung fungi, sort of mushroom-based origin chitosan, keeping to uh, plant-based ingredients for this research. Now, um, Chitosan can be used as a bioplastic. It has a natural nitrogen content, and so it's also been used as a natural organic fertilizer as well. Um, and it's that nitrogen content that makes it successful as a biomordant um, for linen. It, it, it effectively provides active dye sites for the natural dyes to fix. Um, and then the Simplocos plant extract that we used was sourced from the Beverly Foundation who build partnerships with rainforest communities and indigenous textile artists in Indonesia to alleviate rural poverty and empower uh, textile artisan women. So even though it's not something that you can grow locally, 
it was really good to be able to support a foundation such as this. Um, Simplocos is a bioaccumulator. It naturally accumulates um, aluminium from the soil and therefore acts in a very similar way to the more traditional mordants, giving a comparable result to the alum lactate that we used as a control or a benchmark for comparison. Um, and finally, I'm sure you're all aware of soya. We use this in a soya milk format with no additives. Um, in addition, um, in, a, in the dyeing as a pretreatment, it acts as a protein binder for natural dyes. Next slide, please. So using our, our chosen biomordants, we analysed a range of dye temperatures, um, pH levels and concentrations to find the optimal dyeing conditions for each biomordant. Um, and we confirmed this with colour measurement. So all tests were conducted using an infrared dye machine, which is uh, basically like a lab scale commercial dye machine. And that was really important to be able to replicate the conditions accurately to show the potential for industrial uptake of this process within the fashion system. Um, all processes were performance tested to commercial standards and, and shown to be suitable for mild laundering at 40 degrees C. So we'd say the work has been successful in identifying viable plant and algae based alternatives to metal mordants. Next slide, please. Uh, that slide just shows um, kind of the colour range that we were able to achieve by altering some of the parameters um, and using these different biomordants. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, moving on to laser pretreatment. Um, a little bit about lasers. They're already established digital manufacturing tools within the textile industry. And they've got a real potential to provide energy efficient dry processing um, that offer environmental as well as economic efficiency. So current uptake of laser techniques for textile design in the textile industry don't really go beyond cutting applications and the fading of denim. Um, but in my past research, I've come up with several different laser textile design techniques it's all based around modifying material properties um, by harnessing the, photo for the photothermal properties of an infrared laser. So in this work, I was really interested to expand the possibilities of laser patterning as a digital process um, and as a possible pretreatment for linen. Um, you'll see in this video on the next slide that the laser can very quickly impart digital designs onto textiles. And I've just realised that I've given you a PDF, so I'm not sure if that video will play. Will it, Frank? Is it? Maybe not. Sorry, no, Laura, I don't think Don't worry, that's all right. That's all right. Video, sorry. I will, uh, I will add the video to the recording afterwards if you send me the video later sure. so people can it's, view the video a, afterwards. It's a very short video. It just shows the sort of speed of the laser um, putting that pattern down onto the linen. Um, so next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so I discovered that uh, a specific range of laser parameters, the um, laser radiation causes a, a fading effect on the natural linen. Um, image on the left shows the subtle differences between parameter squares where the laser effect has taken place. And I was able to use colour measurement to quantify this effect. So I used a spectrophotometer to measure the whiteness index. Um, and that's plotted on the, the graph shown on the slide there. Um, now, it shows quite a significant colour change is taking place here. So if you look over uh, right on the um, axis, the uh, if we look at linen sample two, for example, the untreated linen has a value of almost minus 50 compared to the laser treated areas of the textile with values around minus 10 to minus 20. So we can take those peaks of the, of the graph to indicate the optimal parameters um, as laser energy density increases beyond that. We're starting to see the linen get darker again. Um, and that's as a result of 
probably some burning that would eventually lead to damage of the textile fibres. Next slide, please. So if we look at some of those parameters under the microscope, um, we can see that the damage isn't significant, but there's some signs of charring beginning to show up as brown specks in treatments um, number four and five. We can see that there's also a textural change as the laser energy density increases compared to the untreated sample. Um, the untreated is the, the first image. And we're removing some of the luster from the fibres and that lightened effect matches what we're seeing with the colour whiteness measurement. Next slide, please. So um, after some early material performance testing, uh, it showed that the effect was washed fast. However, it did seem to rub off under wet conditions during um, abrasion and rub fast testing. So um, also looked at this as a pretreatment to dyeing and the effect showed quite a significant decline in dye uptake in the laser irradiated areas. Um, which would indicate them to be more hydrophobic than the untreated surface. So I saw this as a really exciting design opportunity to use the laser treatment as a resist to dyeing. But I really wanted to understand what was happening on the linen and to do some further material characterization on the fading effect to see if it was um, to see if it was some sort of additional substance that was being activated on the surface by the laser. Next slide, please. Um, so I was fortunate enough to be introduced to Catherine Riddle from the Health Tech Lab here at UWE, who offered to analyse the samples using Raman spectroscopy. Um, and she provided me with these, these graphs, these uh, readings. Um, so the arrows that point down, um, labelled cellulose, indicate that they're the, the peaks of a normal cellulose material. And that arrow labelled carbon pointing upwards shows the more intense treatments to have quite a significant carbon peaks compared to the earlier treatments. Um, so we know um, that some burning is probably taking place on those higher treatments. Um, in the second set of graphs, peaks show the presence of a material other than cellulose or carbon. So we know that there's an additional substance in there somewhere, but as it wasn't present on the database, we can only make an informed guess that it could be uh, either a residue from the weaving process. Um, there's a substance called sizing that's often used to prevent yarns from getting tangled during winding and warping in weaving. Um, and although all our fabrics were washed and scoured before experimentation, if this is a hydrophobic substance, which it appears to be, it could still be present in the material. Um, or it could be another more oily aspect of the lignin content within the linen fibre itself. So I'm hoping with a little bit of further investigation, we will be able to uncover this. But it's really nice to have that collaboration with our neighbours in the health tech lab as well. Next slide, please. So um, these natural linen textile samples have been designed by combining the bio dyeing processes with the digital laser treatment. Um, the linen was pre-treated firstly with oak gall to add tannin, secondly mordanted with simplocos, which we find to be the most effective of the uh, bio mordant treatments. And then the printed design features were applied using the laser. And finally, the textiles were dyed using a range of plant-based natural dyes. So this um, particular color palette was achieved using mixtures of madder, weld, chlorophyllin, wood, uh, and satin wood dye extracts. Next slide, please. So this slide shows a laser garment pattern piece. Again, the linen garment pattern piece has been produced using the 
bio um, and the digital dyeing uh, and design processes. So this work, um, you know, I, I'm, I'd say I'm really pleased with the successful samples that have come out of these processes. But the, the goal really is to show that alternative and kinder manufacturing systems um, and production systems are possible for textiles. So, so what are the benefits that we can see? Um, the laser has been used as a digital patterning process that adds precision and design flexibility. The uh, laser part of the treatment is a dry process that can be performed as an accurate placement print, combining design and pattern cutting in one process. Um, or the laser designs can be applied direct to a garment, offering digital customization, showcasing the potential to be used as part of an agile or on-demand local production system. And then combining that obviously with the bio dyeing processes, allow these textiles to remain biodegradable and, and completely natural, which has benefits for the environment, but also for you know, ourselves and, and on our skin and what we actually take in. Next slide, please. Um, so biodigital textile design, what is it? Um, as I hinted at the beginning, one of the overarching aims of my research was to combine the precision and the flexibility of digital technology with the sustainable profile of biodesign. This work has acted as a case study um, and just one example really um, of this as a methodology. So the two processes, the bio and the digital working together. Um, and I see this approach as like a really valuable way to enhance and add value to natural materials um, and to encourage more local and considered design systems. Next slide, please. Um, and then just as a sneak peek into some of the other work that we've been doing on the project, um, we've also been applying this biodigital methodology to biomaterial design. Um, we've been investigating biomaterials as like textile or leather based alternatives, non leather alternatives, should I say, and also as finishings and coatings on linen enhanced by the laser processing. Um, we've also been collaborating with CFPR's NEVE, um, finding crossovers into printmaking. So yeah, watch this space for updates on that one. Next slide, please. Um, and just one last note, uh, in September last year, I exhibited this work as part of the UK's first Sustainable Fashion Week that we were really quite fortunate enough to have here in Bristol. Um, and that work is currently on display, again, in CFPR's brand new exhibition space in the corridor leading to W Block. So if you're in the building, do go and check out the samples that I've been talking about in real life. Next slide, please. Okay, and that's me. So thank you very much. There was some applause just now from uh, my colleagues here. I'm just going to just, uh, turn the camera around to, to prove that we weren't here on our own. So, uh, you know, there was lots of applause. Thank you, Laura. And uh, there was some lunch being consumed as well. So, uh, Great. thank you. Thank you for that. And there's some comments from Sophie on here as well. I'm just trying to do the hammer operating as well as the as everything else at the moment. So it's very inspirational from Sophie. Um, I have an, a follow on question, which is basically about the following on from the grant that the Vice Chancellor's Early Careers Research Grant. Um, mm -hmm. What's next? Is, is there uh, some another follow up grant that you're pursuing? Uh, where do you see that that research uh, going in terms of uh, using it as a as a first step to something new? Um, so the next step really is, oh, sorry, I'm just going to turn it on. I can hear my echo. Um, the next step really is to um, apply for funding to continue with the idea of developing this biodigital textile design. 
as um, as a methodology um, for for sustainable textiles, um, and and also trying it out with some companies as well. So we did have some project partners on on this project, but you know because of restrictions and things like that, some of our plans didn't really go into fruition um so we're they're looking and they're interested in um, being involved in another bid um where we can hopefully test out some of those processes in in a real life local scale as well are there any ways that um just thinking ahead of this now uh, that the uh, the lasers you're using are they industrial sort of size lasers as well and are they being used for pre-production i.e before the cloth is cut into fern is into uh textiles into garments then or is this something that could be used as a post treatment to already bought um textiles that someone could sort of customize themselves at home or is that something that's not quite? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely a possibility with um, digital manufacturing. The, the laser that I've used is is the um, flatbed laser, which is pretty kit um, in, uh, you know, any, any sort of digital fabrication lab. Um, so it's it, quite accessible to the general public if, if they have access to um, a fab lab or anything like that. Um, but also, you know, it's something that can be done quite close to market. So, you know, this idea of on-demand production, I think is really interesting. The fact that you could kind of create blanks, garment blanks, and then um, add sort of design and customization to them much closer to market or, or when they're bought really, so that you're not stock holding like lots of, lots of product that people haven't ordered or want to buy. That's, that's exactly what and that also would make the whole process more environmentally friendly because we can as you said we can exactly, all not exactly. stop and do something else so yeah um thank you uh, are there any questions any other questions from our esteemed audience either virtual or for real here okay so there's some nice comments there from neve and from angie and Karina is also reminding us to uh, not to forget to look at the example. And at this point, it might be worthwhile mentioning Rosie as well, because you had a collaborator um, to, to help you with the research. So Rosie Haywood, who was... Um, um, can you just maybe explain a little bit about Rosie's role that uh, you, sure. you had um, to encourage um, maybe other, other people to apply for posts like this if they come up? Absolutely. I'm, I'm not sure if I mentioned when I um, at the a, um, graduate from the MA design program at UE. Um, and she fought off some quite strong competition um, to to get this post as an RA. Um, um, and it was her expertise in uh, textile natural dyeing, really, that, that won her the role. So um, yeah, it was it was really great having Rosie as a research associate on the project, um, and it, you know it, I think that was the real beauty um, and the benefit of receiving that internal funding was that I was able to hire um, Rosie as a research associate on the project. Um, you know, it just made the amount of tech. Um, and experimentation that we were able to do achievable in in the sort of short time frame that the project ran for so uh, you can maybe just mention that you uh, achieved all this uh, during the move to not just was under covid circumstances but also during the move uh, from bauer to french as well um, yes so yeah we had quite a lot of disruption with covid and uh, and moving and all that <laughs> <laughs> there, um, a question come from Karina here as well uh, was can you change the tonal range uh, with the laser um on this particular process that I've shown not so much there are other um, textile laser uh, processes where um, you're actually using the heat of the laser to um, encourage the dye uptake um, and you can change the laser parameters to encourage different amounts of dye uptake. But on this particular process, 
it's it's more of a, a two-tone effect. I think that that sort of concludes our question and answers. I think so. Uh, unless there's anybody else has any other questions, Taus is looking quite. Uh, Hang on, I shall pass you over to Clark, to Taus just a second. Hello. Hello, hello. Uh, how long was the project from start to finish? So, could you uh, say that again? Long, how long was the project from start? How long um, was the project? Um, the project started, started in twenty. Um, it was supposed to finish in August twenty twenty one. Instructions, um, mostly the fact that we couldn't access um the facilities for quite a while because of COVID. I did get an extension, and so the project just finished at the end of November there. Okay, so the, um, the question from Nicola Rice, um, do you need to use natural products indigenous to the country of production for eco-purposes? Is that, um, did you hear um, that? You don't need to, um, but it, it, it's the kind of example that, um, that I'm really trying to push with in this research. Not all of the of materials and ingredients that we used were from, from the UK. But I think it'd be really nice to be able to show a process that 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 was regional. Um, you know, it adds that element of being able to be resilient and self-sufficient as well as um, as as well as the other sort of environmental benefits. Yeah, that sort of makes perfect sense to keep it all in within reach you work in as well I suppose um, is there um, and you've already mentioned that you've you were, were you're working with other materials already Are there, is there anything else in the pipeline in terms of using different materials apart from the linen and flax and uh, cotton that you might have used already um, we have we have some discussions with who create a, a regenerated cellulose pro uh, product called Tense lyocell, um, which could be quite interesting. It's a, it is a um, technically synthetic material. However, it's derived from, it can be derived from recycling um, from cellulose materials. So, yeah, we're kind of hoping that something might come out of that very soon. And the final question maybe um, is about uh, the color range. How can you, de are there ways of extending or adding it to the color range? Yes, of course. Um, so I think I mentioned that some of the parameters that we were experimenting with to optimize um, color strength, you can alter. So you can alter things like pH. Um, Looking at madder, for example, altering the pH, you can move from kind of pinky tones through to really deep reds, through to oranges, which you know is is quite an extensive kind of color range from one dye stuff. Um, obviously, things like uh, using changing the color, uh, the concentration as well, can change the the intensity of the of the color effect as well. And are there other um, dye materials that uh, maybe towards the blues, like I mean, in photography, you use a cyanotype process, which creates a plush, mm -hmm. the plush mm -hmm. blue. I mean, maybe that could is that an opportunity to use some of that? So those crossover points as well. Eh? Yes. Well, actually, um, it's good that you mentioned that because we're hoping at CFPR to start growing some um, indigo come this forthcoming year. Um, and indigo and woad, which is kind of a, a, a UK based plant equivalent that creates a blue um, can create some really, really strong, vibrant blue colours. So, um, yeah, we we're really hoping that we can utilise some of our homegrown um, plant. Wonderful. Excellent. OK, well, I think.
that sort of concludes the questions and um, chats comments. So uh, in the chat, I'm still struggling with this little silly cable here. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but yeah, so I think we can probably just conclude the talk for now. Uh, thank you again very much for, for sharing your presentation and your work with us. Um, and yeah, thank you for everyone else for joining us at this lunchtime. Um, and uh, just a reminder that the talks, all the talks are recorded and uh, on the cfpr.ue.ac.uk website. Uh, our next uh, talk is again from an internal speaker. So we have our own Javi uh, Ore talking about his uh, recent research and which was also funded by the university's vice chancellor's early career research grant. So I'm looking forward to seeing that in uh, to, to sharing that with you in two weeks' time. In the meantime, um, thank you very much. Everyone has um, uh, got some, some virtual claps and clapping and, and, and thumbs up here. And uh, everyone else here is also clapping away. So thank you for joining us all, and we'll see you next time. Cheers, Laura. Bye bye. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks very much, everyone.